Okay, welcome to Tuesday, May the 7th. You know, there are so many things to celebrate right now, some of which you may not be aware of. There's American Wetlands Month, it's Clean Air Month in some areas of the country, and it's National Wildflower Week. I mention those because I feel they relate to today's edition of Green Builder Media's Impact Series, Game Changers in Sustainability. Today, Dr. Mark Hospitetler joins us to give us a presentation about his experiences in shifting conventional development into something more compatible with urban biodiversity conservation. Now, before we get started, I wanted to tell you that today's webinar would not be possible without the support of our generous sponsors. And those sponsors are DuPont. DuPont puts science to work by creating sustainable solutions essential to a better, safer, healthier life for people everywhere. DuPont is focused on dynamic science that generates real-world solutions. That's why DuPont is at the forefront of building science with brands you can depend on like Tyvek, Sentry Glass, Corian Solid Surfaces, Zodiac Quartz Surfaces, and Kevlar. BASF. BASF is a leader in the construction industry. With more than 600 products serving 75 construction product categories, BASF offers the broadest portfolio of products used directly on construction sites or integrated into other products to improve the performance of construction projects. BASF is also a global leader in sustainability and corporate social responsibility, committed to constant improvements in safety, protection of health, and environmental conservation. Bio-based insulation. Bio-based insulation spray polyurethane products help to lessen the environmental impact of residential and commercial structures by sealing and in one step. Bio-based insulation integrates rapidly renewable ingredients as replacement for a portion of the petroleum in many of their insulation products without hindering performance and has replaced chemical blowing agents with water. And finally, the Green Builder Coalition. The Green Builder Coalition amplifies the voice of green builders and professionals to drive advocacy and education for more sustainable building practices. For more information, log on to GreenBuilderCoalition. Org. I'm Mike Kalignan, Executive Director of the Green Builder Coalition, and I'm sitting in for Ron Jones today. So I'll be your host and moderator for today's webinar. Now I hope that during the course of today's presentation, you'll submit questions for our guests. To do so, simply use the small box at the bottom of the q and I'll review those questions and pose them to Mark during the Q&A time set aside near the end of the webcast. Now to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Mark Hostetler is a professor in the Department of Wildlife Ecology and Conservation at the University of Florida. Mark has over 20 years of experience in urban wildlife and green development issues. He co-founded the University of Florida's Program for Resource Efficient Communities and collaborates with an interdisciplinary team of scientists and graduate students to foster green development projects nationally and internationally. He also serves on the advisory board of Urbio, which is a scientific network for education and research that promotes urban biodiversity across the globe. Mark recently wrote The Green Leap, Conserving Biodiversity in Subdivision Development, which today's presentation is based on. He has appeared on numerous TV and radio programs and has been featured in multiple magazine and newspaper articles. Mark also has produced and directed an award-winning TV series titled Living Green, currently being shown on various PBS and cable stations across the U.S. Dr. Hostetler has a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Purdue University and received his Master's and Ph.D. in Zoology from the University of Florida. Mark, welcome to the Impact Series. Thanks, Mike. Well, thanks, so, and go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I... Uh, I uh, certainly welcome you to the Impact Series and uh, wanted to uh, make you feel welcome. And I, I'm interested in hearing your presentation today on the Green Leap. Thanks, Mike, and welcome to everybody out in the Internet land, um, both east and west coast and, and uh, from around the world, I understand. Um, what I'd like to talk about in the next 35 minutes is kind of this Green Leap, how do we shift from conventional directions and development into something a little bit different in terms of conserving biodiversity and subdivision development? 
And the way I've structured uh, the webinar is first, if we're going to talk about biodiversity, let's define it. I'm going to give some definitions about biodiversity conservation. And then I'm going to talk about the decision makers within urban communities communities and, and the relationship and how that's important in terms of if we're going to do conservation developments that conserve biodiversity, how we need to address each of these decision makers. <clears throat> and then I'll talk a little bit about conservation developments, an alternative type of uh, development strategy, and I'll give an overview of some of the issues with design, construction, and post-construction. And in, and in one part of the talk, uh, I'll talk about post-construction -constru issues because that's rarely addressed when we talk about doing green development. And I think that's an important issue that needs some attention. And then I'll finish with uh, a continued education course that's available online for people to get more details um, about uh, green development and biodiversity conservation. So to give a little more background about myself, I'm a wildlife professor, uh, happened to work in urban communities for a number of years. And there's a group of us called the Program for Resource Efficient Communities. And this group has served as a portal for the last, oh, about 10 years now to address a variety of issues within the, the built environment. And we have municipalities, the developers, the built environment professionals, and a number of uh, various groups that are interested in green developments and we, pro we provide consulting services as well as research-based information to help with such uh, endeavors. Now with that uh, experience as an academic, uh, I'll kind of over the next few minutes describe some of my interactions and some of the research and case studies that we've been doing to address green development uh, as communities grow. So what is biodiversity? Uh, many of you probably recognize it as species diversity, it's just simply the number of different species that you find in a given area. But we also define it in terms of ha habitat diversity, the number of different ecosystems such as prairies, forests, uh, wetlands, etc. Et and also genetic diversity uh, when we think about uh, keeping you know, species in the north part of Florida that are the same species as the south part of Florida but because of different climate conditions they have different genetics, so we try to get the, keep the genetic diversity along with the species diversity and habitat diversity. Now, in terms of conserving biodiversity, I think it's important to recognize that when ecologists talk about biodiversity conservation, we're focusing on native and endemic species. Native species are those species that are found in a given area pre-European colonization. And endemic species are those species that are native and found nowhere else in the world. And there are many examples of this from one region to the next. So, for example, in Florida, we have the Florida panther uh, in the Everglades uh, that is found nowhere else in the world. And so if we do lose that species, we, you, we lose a really unique species and global biodiversity declines. So this is in... You know, it's not really species richness that we're talking about. We're just talking about focusing on native and endemic species. So biodiversity in Florida, you can see the panther in the background there. This, this guy has been used as ambassador around Florida. And it's a biodiversity hot, hot spot. We have over 2,800 um, native plants. Uh, of those, 224 are endemic. Uh, we have a variety of endemic vertebrates and over 1,500 endemic uh, species of invertebrates um, that are found in Florida. If we go out west in California, it's another biodiversity hotspot. Uh, if you're in California, raise your hand. I can see it. Uh, anyway, there's over 2,000 endemic plants, plants that are found nowhere else in the world, as well as some birds, mammals, and amphibians. So why conserve urban biodiversity? Why not, you know, as environmentalists and conservationists, why don't we just concentrate on the land around urban areas? I think there's a wide variety of reasons why we need to concentrate on urban areas. First of all, 
there are many social and economic benefits. Uh, for example, when natural open space is conserved in urban areas, home prices that are located near these areas are higher. Uh, urban landscapes are, <clears throat> are the primary areas where many people interact with local plants and animals. So I think this is where most people experience their natural heritage. So it's important to recognize that and to, and to have that experience within the urban area. As you can see from the little yellow uh, shaded area below, over 67 million people experience wildlife uh, within um, and around their own home. But I think a third component is that <clears throat> urban areas really do impact surrounding natural ecosystems. So we need to think about how they are designed and managed to minimize that impact. I'll give you a couple examples. Here's one in uh, North Florida, North Central Florida. Uh, Gainesville is right in the center there. And we have what's called a 2060 report, where uh, in 50 years, we're expected double in population size. And you can see on the top slide, that's the current view. And that's a futuristic view. And all those green areas that were conserved natural areas slowly get surrounded by the urban landscape. And if we back up in scale and look at North America as a whole, uh, you can see that, may, well, maybe if you actually look at the land mass, only 10 to 15 percent of the land area is urban. But the impacts go way beyond this. And this is a satellite image of light pollution at night. And you can see the really dense metropolitan areas. But you can see that there's a lot of connections uh, from even from one country to, to the next. If you're from Canada or if you've been to Canada, you've been up in the boreal forest, there are a few large towns up there. But you see a lot of light. And you're like, where's that light coming from? I'll let you pause on that for a second. It's actually gas flares from oil exploration. So even the boreal forest up in what we call wilderness, what's going on in, in the US in terms of energy consumption impacts wilderness far away. So if we're going to design and manage urban communities um, to conserve natural resources, and particularly our, our plants and animals, who are the decision makers? Who do we need to reach? First we have, this is a kind of a cartoon. And this is a Southwest example. This was when I was working at Arizona State University as a postdoc a number of years ago. And you can imagine in the, in the desert, if you're the homeowner on the left there, kind of, I guess, androgynous path, who's decided to do turf in the middle of the desert, which takes a lot of water and fertilization, and not to mention it's a monoculture, so very little biodiversity, as opposed to the homeowner on the right who's decided to do something a little different with a little deerscaping, using native saguaro, some other cacti. You can imagine those decisions are made within hours and maybe implemented within days or weeks. Uh, and maybe one doesn't understand why the other one did the different types of practices. But cumulatively, if all homeowners did what the, the, the greenie on the right had done, then you get a very huge impact on biodiversity with the number of native plants and animals that would survive in that um, subdivision. But those homeowners are constrained. And if you think about the developer and built environment professionals, from environmental consultants, you know, architects, landscape architects, civil engineers, et cetera, with one stroke of the pen, they really set the framework and tone for the community. So they decide where the roads are, how big the lots are, what type of landscaping palette, what kind of a stormwater treatment system is used, whether to use natives or exotics when the landscape, uh, what type of covenants are um, done for the subdivision. If you're in a master plan community, we have a lot of homeowner associations in Florida and elsewhere. That really constrains what the homeowner can do. So maybe the homeowner would like to convert the lawn to more zero escaping, but it may not be possible because of environmental covenants or the norm for the community is mainly turf in the front yard. So thinking about uh, the developers, the developers are also constrained by policymakers and planners. And so planners, with some input from the public, here's a meeting in Florida for a comprehensive development plan that dictates how communities will grow for the next five to seven years. And so that really says what the land use is, what the land use map is in terms of where development goes, where agricultural is preserved, et cetera. And then you have land development regulations that also are um, providing uh, some regulations and some um, um, 
constraints on what the developer can or can't do once a subdivision is, is built. So being a wildlife biologist myself, I, I've looked, there's many connections between decisions made by people uh, on the landscape in, for this example, uh, wildlife. And so here we have a red-tailed hawk uh, pictured on the top frame of this diagram and a Carolina wren down below. So where the hawk locates, if you see a hawk in your neighborhood, it's really dependent on what's going on way at a broader scale than your own backyard. It's whole sections of a city. And this is at the range of city planners and developers. Um, as opposed to the Carolina wren, the Carolina wren is a smaller bird. And a developer's decisions and homeowners, individual homeowner decisions, can provide enough habitat for a wren. And that would affect the distribution of the wren across the landscape. If I was to throw up this heuristic model here, if you think about the, the decision makers, you have the policy makers constraining what developers can do, developers constraining what citizens and homeowners can do, but there's some important feedback loops. Uh, citizens with purchasing power can demand a different product from developers and contractors, etc. Developers with their economic power also have lots of influence on policymakers and planners. And the far uh, arrow on the left there is when citizens through elections can elect um, different um, elected officials that uh, can also make policy. So if it's a goal to conserve urban biodiversity, we need more development, more concentration on how to incorporate green infrastructure into design and management plans. And I think there's two steps to this. Um, I think every development has its abilities uh, and constraints and opportunities from the smallest site to the largest site. Um, so one of the goals is to conserve natural resources, biodiversity on site. But I think a second goal is really to think about how that urban area is, uh, uh, how we can design and management to, to minimize impact on surrounding areas. We think about the, how urban landscapes really do have impacts beyond their boundaries. And so conservation development is one of the buzzwords out there that talk about uh, more alternative types of uh, development schemes. There's conservation subdivision design, uh, traditional neighborhood development, if you incorporate biodiversity. There's many different buzzwords out there. But think about the three phases of a development. You have the design phase, which is important, you know, where the roads are, where the homes and any natural space is conserved. But there's two other phases that I think are equally, if not more important. That's construction. So you can imagine all the subcontractors and contractors coming onto a site and implementing the design. And things can go very well, or can they have uh, dramatic impacts? And also post-construction. This is where, if you have the design and construction right, then you have people move in from perhaps all over the country, all over the state, even internationally. And how they manage their homes, yards, and neighborhoods have implications for conservation. So I threw up a few site design issues. There's many more, but you can imagine that, that yes, the framework is very important. If um, there's almost no, if it's all impervious surfaces, um, if there's a very fragmented design, there's lots of fragmentation many, uh, in, in a development site that uh, many of our sensitive species are, are, um, cannot do well in a fragmented landscape. They do better in large continuous patches. So that's an issue. You can have improper inventory of natural areas. So there might be some really good habitat within um, the site itself, but it's built upon, and the natural areas are more uh, dilapidated habitat. So there's many issues during the site design. But if we think about the construction issues, there's a whole range of these. How many of you have been on a construction site where in many states you have regulations about silt fences? So the silt fences are designed to maintain stormwater runoff um, into wetlands and other water bodies. But how many of those are actually maintained through the whole construction period? Um, you can think about earthwork machines. I think earthwork machines have one of the biggest impacts in terms of compacting the soil, destroying vegetation that was marked for conservation, and even impacting natural areas. And then there's, there's decisions made with the landscape palette, with the stormwater treatment system, with um, the lighting system, all those things are done during construction. In a way, they, those choices are very critical 
in terms of how that impacts local wildlife and plant communities. So here's an example in Florida. It's hot. If any of you are from Florida, have been to Florida, that a lot of the contractors will park their earthwork machines in shade. And so this is a buffer area just in the back of the homes being built there in the foreground. And this buffer area was designed to manage stormwater to filtrate water as it runs off the impervious surface into the wetland in the, in the background. So depending on, you know, these earthwork machines, it only takes one to two passes to compact the soil so there's less filter, filtration uh, opportunities for the water. Plus it destroys some of the vegetation. There's lots of studies that show that compacting the soil around the drip line can really smother the roots and kill the trees. So you can imagine if the earthwork machines aren't managed appropriately, even during the design phase, that buffer area that's been marked for conservation gets impacted during the construction phase. And then there are a variety of post-construction issues. Um, you can imagine people, for example, you have natural areas, but then they become the backyard playgrounds for the community. All-terrain vehicles are run through their foot traffic. Um, people accidentally plant invasive exotics in their yards or have feral cat colonies. Uh, a lot of times large remnants need uh, management, uh, invasive exotic control, prescribed burning if you're in an ecosystem that requires pres prescribed burns. And there's a whole wide range of things from uh, how yards are maintained from irrigation to pesticide use to fertilize, uh, how much fertilizer is put on there towards impact on the natural areas nearby. Even feeding wildlife. and I kind of throw this out here because if you build in Florida and you have, I can hear the laughter throughout the internet world right now, there's a tradition, I don't know where it started, but feeding marshmallows to alligators. And well, alligators like it, um, it's cheap, um, people can bring these large reptiles up close, but you can imagine the impacts of this because naturally alligators have a fear of humans, but if you feed them, they lose that fear and they become an actual danger within a de development. And um, uh, small children, particularly pets, are in danger once alligators lose their fear. So it's important to recognize that if you build a conservation development, there are going to be post-construction issues. Maybe not so dramatic as feeding alligators, but you can imagine other parts of the country uh, feeding bears, all that kind of stuff can really uh, wreak havoc within the subdivision. So it, it's all about engagement. We need trained and motivated developers and architects and environmental consultants to do the site layout. We need trained and motivated contractors, civil engineers, landscaping companies, all of those people associated with the construction part of the, of the development. And we need educated and motivated homeowners. And I would say we need all to reach all of these uh, people during uh, a con conservation development in order for it to be successful. And what I'd like to do is just spend a little bit of time about this third phase post-construction, mainly because I've seen many green developments um, fail, both when I've uh, had some interactions with them, but also in uh, many of the research that's out there showing that these conservation developments do not do a good job in terms of conserving uh, biodiversity. And this comes from studies from some of my students, myself, and other researchers around the country that when we look at people that live in subdivisions, most of them uh, aren't green, if I could use that word. They score low in terms of environmental attitudes, knowledge, or behaviors. And when we compare green developments, homeowners from green developments to, the, to those that are conventional, there is no difference in these various measures. Uh, homeowners do have an appropriate information to manage, I mean, they don't have appropriate information to manage homes, yards, and neighborhoods. Uh, we've shown that study after study. And often when you go to a master plan community that's touted as green, you go into the sale office and there's banners of wildlife and all the green features, but that sale office in information is often not adequate. Homeowners forget the information over time, particularly when homes uh, are resold and the developer has, is, is long gone. So how do you create that norm within the community that um, um, natural resource conservation is part of the everyday life? But Study after study has shown that homeowners, you know, they don't want to have impacts. They do desire local environmental information and how to and how to manage their landscapes in a way that minimize impacts on surrounding natural areas. So that's encouraging. And if you look at conservation developments, as I mentioned, many have not uh, been adequately managed. 
and are not much better than conventional. There's one, one study in Colorado that showed limited biodiversity in conserved open space when compared to more conventional designs. And there are very few open space regulations that address long-term management for biodiversity. It's usually about the clustering, what percentage to cluster, but there's nothing about the, the management of the built space and the management of the open space. So that's why many of them failed, uh, is that there's just impacts coming from the built areas. So invasive exotics have spread in from the, from the uh, landscapes themselves into the natural areas. Or it's just individual behaviors uh, using ATV, motorized traffic, pets off leash, et cetera. There's a number of different things that um, these small remnants or natural areas can be impacted by the built areas. And overall, it's just management is lacking. They're, they're, again, the design might have, let's say, 60% of open space conserved, but there is no funding set aside. There's no management plan to uh, hire an environmental professional to come in and periodically uh, uh, do some management of the open space and look for uh, impacts coming from the built areas. So what are some of the solutions? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about neighborhood educational programs. This one here is, is in the town of Harmony. I'll talk more about Harmony. And here you can see the sign down on the bottom here about prescribed fire. They're doing prescribed fire in these natural remnants, but you can imagine it takes a lot of buy-in from homeowners to understand the importance of prescribed berms, not only for wildlife and for the plants, but also to uh, decrease the hazard of big fires erupting in and around these subdivisions. So these signs were placed along the sidewalks, and I'm going to talk about this education program uh, that's been uh, completed in Florida. And I throw up this slide uh, just to say, how do we reach the typical Floridian with their pool, they have a little bit of a backyard, um, and open spaces nearby. And I laugh because this is actually my colleague, Dr. Ray Carthy, who's a CTRO biologist, and he's heard about this uh, slide and picture of himself. He hasn't seen it yet. He's been using many, many presentations. Thanks, Ray. So. You have dynamic educational signs as part of it. And when I say dynamic, these signs, uh, instead of having embossed signs, are very expensive, and you can't change the information. The one that you saw before, you actually pop out the, the cover and you put in a new panel for about 80 to $90. So as issues change or as the signs fade out, you can change them fairly easily. Now, this is connected to a website, which is also connected to um, environmental covenants, and a brochure for homeowners. Now, if you're interested in learning more about this program, you can go to this website that's on the top of the slide, and it discusses the town of Harmony and, the, and Madera in Gainesville, Florida. And you can see the website. It gives uh, thematic issues of using water, using waste, and the uniqueness of the website is it's tailored for that specific community. It's not kind of a general thing. It's actually tailored with input from the developer and some environmentalists uh, within the area. And so people can go from the, the kiosk, the little signs that they see in the neighborhood, and find out more information when they go to this website tailored to their community. Plus, you can update information fairly quickly um, as issues change. Now, we did a study. We compared um, the education program within the town of Harmony to a control community, and we tracked the residents for over a period of four years. And we found that uh, with the education program, residents increased their capability to apply environmental practices. So they, before, they didn't really know how to manage their yards in an environmental way, uh, and the control didn't improve as much. And they did also have some improvement in terms of, of environmental attitudes, knowledge, and behaviors. Now, most residents use the dynamic signs. I would have to say if there's any one step to at least start passive engagement is to put the signs in. Uh, a few people did go to the website. Uh, hardly anyone saw the brochure as they went through the sales and marketing thing. But the signs they actually did see as they walk on um, uh, walk through the neighborhood. So how can government support uh, conservation development initiatives that actually conserve biodiversity? And if we look at those, go back to those three phases, I think there are a lot of initiatives out there, and you hear a lot of cluster design type of initiatives. But we have very little policy to address 
construction and post-construction phase. I mean, how do we encourage uh, trained contractors and inform residents in these uh, subdivisions? I'll give out one example we're researching right now in Colorado. Is that, uh, it's an incentive-based policy where you give a density bonus for stewardship practices. So you go one step beyond just the design phase and you address the post-construction phase. And what the developer would get some units uh, based on if they did these five practices. Practices They include a certain percentage of native landscape, landscaping in the built uh, lots. They have environmental community codes and restrictions that address um, many natural resource conservation issues and you know, addressing like pets on leash to establishing feral cat colonies to irrigation and fertilization regimes, et cetera. Um, they also produce a biodiversity conservation and restoration management plan. And I think most importantly, along with that plan, is the funding mechanism. This is key. In fact, I would like to hear from anybody in the audience, have you ever heard of any funding mechanism in any development that's either through homeowner association dues or property taxes that hires an environmental professional to come in to actually do restoration and conservation within and throughout the subdivision. And then the fifth one, of course, is the signage in the neighborhood to help get people engaged about biodiversity and conservation. But we've done some research on incentive-based policies. About 95% of them are, don't have much of an impact. And the ones that were successful is that you develop these incentives with stakeholder input. I think it's important to get the buy-in from the beginning instead of doing the policy in the back room and trying to get stakeholders to buy into it. Plus, stakeholders can actually say, well, this is a real incentive versus what may be come up with uh, by planners and academics. You need a good marketing and education campaign so the policy just doesn't sit on the books. And you need built government capacity. What I mean by that is uh, all departments within the city or county are on board with an incentive. And I'll give you an example. We, have a, we try to do low impact development uh, within our town with rain gardens and swales instead of doing curbs and gutters and culverts. And if a developer was seeking a, a permit, and put that into place, supposedly that would be a fast track. Well, it could actually, and in some cases it did, slow it down because the regulators weren't on board with it. They weren't comfortable with the LID. So rain gardens and swales were not given the credit, a stormwater credit, and so they, a developer would actually have to build both the conventional curb and gutter and the LID to get the credit. So they actually could slow things down and um, not make things very productive, not very much of an incentive when you have to do both systems. How can built environment professionals help to conserve biodiversity? And I think it's all about building model developments. Um, over the past 10 to 15 years, I think I have seen more impact with a maverick developer or a maverick city that has found a landowner and a planning team and a developer to put something really different in the area because it's really about every locality is a little bit different. There's, there's different opportunities and constraints. If you're interested in looking at some of these green communities, there's the web URL below, but Harmony is one, Madeira, even the woodlands at Davidson in North Carolina. And then organize tours of these model developments. That's what we've done through in, with the town of Harmony, it provides local examples for people to see with their own eyes and get own, their own ideas. And actually, over time, it raises the bar for the next developer in the area that's saying, well, I'm not sure how can this be done, and they can just take the planner or the city uh, officials can take them to that, that community to show the next developer. Now, I've spent uh, approximately the last 30 minutes kind of giving an overview of some of the issues and strengths and way forward, but how, what about the details on how to create conservation development? Well, that would take actually another three to four hours of presentation, but there is an online course uh, with a resource manual, and it's been approved for GBCI and AIA CE credits, and participants, participants receive a 126-page resource manual, and you can access that course from gbronline.org. And what's covered in the course is essentially broken out into four presentations. The first one talking about key concepts and players, uh, like 
what are important conservation concepts when you're, when you're concerned about wildlife habitat, and everything from examples of sustainable development projects and policies to financial strategies for conservation. Then we move into the second section, which is broken into three presentations, and it goes through that same um, steps I alluded to about doing the conservation development. You have the, the design phase about where you put things and how to evaluate the landscape in terms of native plants and animals and wildlife. You have the, con uh, the construction phase. Um, this is uh, everything from landscaping techniques to tree and natural area protection strategies for earthwork machines and construction activities and putting in low impact development uh, for stormwater with a biodiversity twist, dark light sky lighting and efficient irrigation. And finally, uh, the last section of the presentation of the course is post-construction. It goes everything about model CCNRs to how to engage residents, open space management, securing permanent funding for management in avoiding and minimizing human-wildlife conflicts. So in summary, if we're, doing, if we're going to do a conservation development, we have to address the decisions made by citizens, developers, and policymakers. Particularly when we identify a piece of land that's going to be subdivided, I think design is important. In fact, it's critical. And we spent a lot of our uh, efforts doing this over the past, I don't know, 20, 30 years, but it's not enough. We need to address construction and post-construction phases. We really need to go the full holistic um, pathway to get a functional development that conserves biodiversity over the long term. And this can all be set up during that construction, design construction period. And if you're interested, uh, there's the web URL for the continuing education course. And for those of you who are more interested to learn about PREC, as we call ourselves, not PREC, <laughs> uh, that's our website, uh, www.billgreen.ufl.edu. Uh, there's my email address. And I've uh, conducted with PREC and sometimes by myself a number of workshops and uh, education forums around the country, even internationally. Um, and I would be happy if anybody's interested uh, to talk more about conserving biodiversity in their own regions. Uh, just give me a shout, and we can arrange something. Great, thank you, Mark. I appreciate the uh, presentation. We we do have a few questions, if you don't mind. Uh, the uh, the first one comes in from Matthew. He wants to know uh, when it comes to species protection, do you find resistance from developers? And if so, how do you overcome that? Well, that's the one thing I've, um, over the years, being an academic and being a wildlife biologist, at first I kind of put developers in one box. And after working with a number of them and seeing their constraints, you know, with everything from getting a project off, a off the ground and the number of hoops they have to jump through and the number of departments they have to see and all the time with the banks breathing down their necks in terms of seeing a product. I've become much more empathetic in, in trying to work out solutions um, to, to not only help them get through that process, but also uh, do species conservation and biodiversity conservation at the same time. So, I think what happens is there's there's a there's when you first approach the subject it depends on the developer there are a few mavericks out there the mavericks you can those are the rare birds you need to find right away and get those examples on the ground because the ones I found to work with um, that are the mavericks and get something on the ground then the next developer that I interact with it's much easier in terms of convincing because I'll just tell you a quick story here. We had, I'll leave out the names, we had several developers uh, in, in Gainesville and one did a kind of a, a, a maverick community with low impact development and very little turf, uh, almost no turf throughout the whole community and left uh, the tree canopy cover, 99% of it. And there was another developer in town that just didn't, did not want to do any of this. 
And so we were doing a tour of the development, and I, the developers were behind me talking. And as we went through the community, um, they went to the first lot and looked at the landscaping, and, and the other developer said, well, where's the landscaping? And this, the first developer said, well, this is the landscaping. It's all natural, et cetera. And he's like, oh, well, that's not my type of landscaping. So we went on. And then they started talking a little bit more about economics as we went from lot to lot. And, and the developers and, one, and the one developer said, well, how much does this all cost you to do this landscaping? And it was about $2,000 less than he was paying for his landscaping. And he said, huh. He goes, well, how fast are your homes are selling? And in fact, his homes were, or this developer's homes were selling faster than the other developer. And then he said, well, how much are you getting per square foot? And the first developer was getting more per square foot than the other developer. So I think if you show them examples of this, you get over that initial, you know, I, don't, I just want to do the same old that I know what to do. Uh, in this case, the developer talking to the developer showed the economics behind, in this case, uh, native plants and conserving some of the natural areas within the community that they could actually make an economic benefit. So I think that's what you need to do is really have an example or several examples and it's much better for one developer to talk to another developer than to me to ever talk to a developer. Okay. You know, you you mentioned the uh, natural landscaping, and that leads me to a question that I had. I wrote an article a while. Excuse me. I wrote an article a while back on neighborhood covenants and their lack of sustainable uh, viewpoint. So my question is. How does one overcome neighborhood covenants that prohibit non-grass yards? <laughs> well, I'll tell, I'll tell you, as you know, it's very difficult. You got you got to have a certain, depending on how the wording goes in the HOA, you got to have a certain percentage of the people vote for changing the rules. So that's that's difficult. Once the norm is set for the community. It's very difficult to change that norm. Subjective norms are a powerful force, and uh, it would take a coup <laughs> to actually change the HOAs. But I still, like I said, those model green developments, I have seen model yards make an impact. So someone, uh, I might as well tell the story. So. This is in Michigan. So there, there is a there is a, a person that lived in this subdivision. I'll remove all references, but anyway, this person moved into the subdivision, liked the community, was an environmentalist, ripped up the turf on the front yard, and put in native prairie landscaping. Promptly got a call and a visit from the homeowner association. Said your covenants say you have to have 80% turf in your front yard. She was like, well. I didn't know this, of course, how, how many people read their covenants, but it's enforceable. And they say, yes, it's very enforceable. So the uh, homeowner got their lawyer and they got in the newspaper, and, and I think in the end half the people were for her, this homeowner, and half were against her. And they got in front of the HOA meeting, and, and, they, and, the, and she stood up and said, I realize that this is enforceable. If you don't make me, if, you, if I don't put in 80% turf, you can find me. I understand that. So everyone thought it was over. She goes, but, now I'm not recommending this. I'm just telling you this is a story. She goes, and I'm from Florida, so I have to tell the story. She said, I will do something that is totally legal if you make me tear up my prairie. Once I put the turf in, I'll put 1,000 plastic pink flamingos in my front yard. So you can imagine they had a choice there to decide between the plastic filming. So I'm not recommending that you go that route, but there are ways, if you really look and discuss it with the HOA, there are ways to um, uh, get around these HOA covenants. And in the state of Florida, there's actually now a state law that says that supersedes any HOA covenant. So if you're actually trying to do a Florida-friendly yard and incorporate a variety of practices, it actually does supersede uh, the HOA covenant. So if you live in a state that passes that law, that's another way to do it. Okay. And, and that leads to a question from Sarah, which is, are you seeing more use of water conserving grass species like, say, for instance, buffalo grass? In certain areas I am, especially in areas where there's drought. So 
um, like there's been little bottlenecks here in Florida where we've gone through periods where the water management district said, no, there's no water, period. And the HOAs are screaming that you have to keep your lawn green, and that ended up in court in several instances. But you are beginning to see where people have experienced um, uh, water so shortages, that alternative grasses are being used. Now, unfortunately, those are in areas where they've seen crisis, um, in areas where there seems like water is abundant and there is no crisis, that's a difficult type of uh, method to do it. But again, I think, again, that one maverick to do something different. Uh, I had a homeowner in a subdivision in Gainesville who t replaced um, the front, that little strip between the sidewalk and the curb, which I hate, but a lot of, a lot of things are done that way. Um, that sod's replaced almost annually in this subdivision because it's all fill dirt and it's very difficult to keep that alive. Well, this homeowner replaced it with perennial peanut. I don't know if you're familiar with that low ground cover. It's a, it's a legume. It fixes nitrogen. And while everyone else's grass was dying and they were replacing it each and every year, this perennial peanut was green even through the drought period. And it produces this nice little yellow flower. It doesn't need to be mowed. Uh, very little maintenance whatsoever. And now other homeowners in the area are thinking, well, you know, this may be the way to go. I don't have to spend so much money replacing the sod each time. So you have to look for those little jewels of examples. Okay. A uh, question from Michelle. It goes back to your population growth slide. Um, you know, obviously you're showing the the population growth, but then isn't that going to be impacted by sea level rise? <laughs> yeah, I mean. This is, the, this is what that, that slide was showing is what is projected based on how Florida being one of those states where we get a lot of um, immigration, that what's on the books currently, what is zoned for development currently, that's showing where it would grow if we doubled in 50, mer 50 million years. But yes, you're right. What happens when sea level rise occurs? I mean, how how do we retreat from you know from the beaches et cetera? Do we armor the whole state of Florida? Do we have a whole dike system like in the Netherlands? Uh, that remains to be seen. But yeah, I mean that's going to be an issue. And in, in Florida, we're well aware of that issue of climate change being a state that's surrounded you know on three sides by water. Um. I encourage others to to send in questions as well. I, I have I have one here um, from myself actually. Uh, I don't recall during your presentation seeing the phrase solar orientation, and so my question is how can solar orientation work together with this type of site design? I, you had a nice diagram, of, an overhead of a site design, and it was on a slide that had the title conservation uh, design. Mm -hmm. How can solar orientation work together with that? Are you referring to the, the house orientation? Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it, it can uh, very well. I mean, that's, that's the thing. There are, very, there are a lot of connections between energy, water, biodiversity, livability, and I think you've hit on one connection. So um, you can orient the homes in a way and put them on the site in a way that can maximize solar exposure, but also you could use for if you're – uh, I'm sorry, maximize, minimize solar exposure uh, unless you're doing, for example, solar panels on the roof, but right. then incorporate the trees along with that, the passive cooling nature of the trees, and those trees can be native, so you can actually um, decrease the loading within the home, not only by the orientation, but by the landscape around it. With the, and, and if you're going to select trees or conserve trees, why not go with the native ones that provide more habitat for wildlife? Right, because it seems like passive solar design should be able to work well with the conservation design uh, of a development. And the solar orientation of a home, uh, just that alone can make uh, as much as 10% a difference on your, energy, on your energy bill. Yeah, no, no, I think there's so many connections between energy, carbon sequestration for climate change, biodiversity, it's, it's all really connected. And I think getting all those disciplines together, that's why we formed 
PREC to do that because a lot of cases it would be energy is the question. But then when we put our foot in the door for energy, then we start talking about the water because they talk about energy to home, but the landscape is also can be energy efficient in terms of how much irrigation. It takes a ton of energy to irrigate a, a land. And then talk about the solar load in terms of coming into the windows. If you, if you position the trees just right or conserve the trees, then you have you know, again, this passive design really making an impact. Uh, final question, unless unless uh, one of our attendees sends one in. I uh, wanted to give you a chance, you were just mentioning PREC, I wanted to give you a chance to kind of plug that a little bit. You, We talked about in the, your intro the, that there's scientists and there's graduate students involved with it. Are there any nonprofits, either locally or nationally, that are also involved? Not with PREC. This is a, an academic kind of group that was really to break down the barriers between departments because we frequently, yeah, we frequently received um, requests and most municipalities and even ourselves don't know how to navigate the university system. I mean, who do we go talk to? I mean, there's, a, you know, here I am, a wildlife t person doing green development, you know. They would never find us, so we just formed that portal and it's been fairly successful. But we do par partner with nonprofits. We partner with um, uh, public entities and private entities to, to do model examples. That's, that's all we're trying to do is get, get a model, like model example in every county in Florida and, and in any state. I think that's, that's the way we can go. So then as a follow-up to any other uh, university faculty that, that may be attending today, have you seen other universities uh, move towards this type of uh, intra-university communication model? You know, that's interesting that you mentioned that. Um, there have been little snippets here and there, and, and, and unfortunately it tends to follow the money. So there's like grants and granting agencies that, that, that do this. So the one I'll just throw out there that I was involved with and it's still going on is a long-term ecological research project. It's LTER, funded by the National Science Foundation. And those are urban, there are two urban LTERs. One's in Phoenix and one's in um, uh, Baltimore. So that's one situation where they're trying to build a network of, you know, looking at how we can design and manage communities in a different fashion. But there's not a lot out there. Well, hopefully uh, through this webinar today and your other presentations, maybe we can see those start to crop up in other parts of the country. I think it would be uh, very helpful to, to get multiple departments working together. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, seeing no other questions from our attendees, I want to thank uh, Dr. Hostetler for his time today. Uh, really appreciate you coming on and sharing your information with us. I also wanted to take one more opportunity to thank our sponsors, BASF, Bio-Based Insulation, DuPont, and the Green Builder Coalition. Uh, thanks again to the audience for joining us today. Mark, thank you again. Uh, very much appreciate the information and the time. Thank you, Mike, and thank you for inviting me to give this webinar. We hope you all join us next month for another edition of the Impact Series, Game Changers in Sustainability. Take care and have a wonderful day.